and welcome to In Conversation with the History Holders of the American Dance Therapy Association, a project made possible by the Marion Chase Foundation. My name is Dr. Jacelyn Viando. When I first conceived of making these videos, I hoped to capture the words of the women who studied with the firsts in our field, Marion Chase, Trudy Shoup, Mary Whitehouse, Alma Hawkins, Blanche Evan, and Lillian Espinak. What culminated in the process was an opportunity to have these women share their stories and their memories in their own words and to capture these parts of history for future generations. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy our conversations. So I am delighted to have Judith Bunny here with me today. Judith, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me and welcome. Thank you, Jocelyn. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So just to start, um, my first question is with whom and where did you begin to study dance therapy? Well, would you believe, you probably would, <laughs> uh, it was exactly 64 years ago this September mm -hmm. that I went to work at Chestnut Lodge in Rockville, Maryland with Mary and Chase. And as you know, there were no training programs mm -hmm. In 1957, uh, no graduate programs. So those of us that wanted to study with Marion were apprenticed. And basically what that meant was we, well, at least in my case, I followed her every schedule, every ward session that she led at Chestnut Lodge. And um, I worked with her for five years, which is probably longer than, than most anybody else. Marion Chase worked full-time at St. Elizabeth's Hospital and a day and a half at Chestnut Lodge. She, she worked Wednesday afternoon and evening and all day Saturday. So those were my schedules when I first began working with her. I had found out that she was at the Chestnut Lodge when I visited Menninger's Clinic and discovered a woman there who had uh, been sent by Menningers to DC to work with Marion and to learn from her so that she could lead dance therapy sessions at Menningers. And she was the one that told me, well, in addition to St. Elizabeth's, Marion works part-time at Chestnut Lodge. Mm -hmm. So I brazenly offered my services to Chestnut Lodge and they hired me literally as a dance therapy right out of college no, no dance therapy training whatsoever. Hmm. Curious, right? Yeah. Auspicious, perhaps. Auspicious. Well, hmm. she and I had communicated when I was 17. I wrote to her because she was getting a lot of publicity in those days. To Marion? Marion Chase, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, she was getting recognition uh, by the Department of Health and, and Human Services, for example. She got their top award. And so there was, there were magazine articles and I wrote to her and suggested, um, asked her for suggestions of what I might uh, study. And she wrote back, handwritten, mm -hmm. uh, you should study anatomy, kinesiology, physiology. And so I ended up with a bio minor, which was not my intent. I had been in a uh, psychology major with a minor in, in theater and dance. And like many that I met later when we were forming the uh, ADTA, the experiences were very similar. We were all drawn to this new profession because we were bridging this gap between uh, dance and psychology. Can I'm sure you've had a similar experience, Jacelyn. Um, somewhat, somewhat, yes. Um, can you speak a little bit more about that draw into the field of dance therapy, like the, the initial sparks of it, perhaps? Well, I was headed for graduate school in psychology. And when I read about dance therapy, it was like, it was like a lightning bolt. Ah, that is it. Mm -hmm. That is for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, it just was a perfect, um, calling almost. And, I could say that about Marion Chase as well. I mean, it was a calling for her. It was like her fourth profession. She had been a concert dancer 
She had uh, run the Denishon studio in Washington. She'd been a choreographer. Um, she was notable for the Cherry Blossom Festival in Washington, which is a big deal in those 40s and 50s. Then she found that she was very skillful in working with the uh, kids that had problems when they came to her studio and people who just wanted to dance for their own well-being. And that kind of puzzled her why people would study dance intensely with not a goal of being a professional uh, performer. Mm -hmm. So she began to study psychotherapy at the Washington School of Psychiatry and became a dance therapist and really was one of the seminal leaders in the field. Can you share, Judith, a little bit um, about your experiences studying under Marion Chase, what that was like? Well, it, as I said, it was an apprenticeship. There mm -hmm. were no formal classes. I followed her. And after each session, we would have a dialogue about what happened, who was present, what was the interaction about. Um, she was an amazing person. She, had, she was an artist. Um, she was a dancer and a humanist. And she treated this work very reverentially. When she came to the studio, she would change clothes from the outside clothes to the studio clothes, in shoes especially. And then she had this incredible presence that it was like a command presence or a dancer's presence. She was very grounded. She absolutely was grounded in her relationships with these patients. And I, I'd like to say that the one thing that it sticks in my mind is that she used music and uh, the rhythm, especially of, of drumming and uh, waltzes, the rhythms mm -hmm. to get rhythmic synchrony established with clients and patients. And that's what I learned from her. Um, mm -hmm. There was movement communication and response. She responded. One thing I'd like to, to correct, if I might, this notion of a Chasian circle. I don't know what that is. I never heard of it. She never talked about a circle. In fact, at Chestnut Lodge, it was a psychoanalytic hospital and the patients were not medicated. And at St. Elizabeth's, the patient, it was the end of the 50s when I worked with her, the middle 50s and the early 60s, and the psychotropic medications were new. They were just coming in. Mm -hmm. So though some at St. Elizabeth's might have had medications, those at Chestnut Lodge did not. Mm -hmm. There was no way these patients would form in a circle to begin a session. She approached each one individually and invited them to move with her. Uh, there's a famous picture of that exact uh, sequence of events. So perhaps there was a circle formed by the ending, but there was no Chasian circle in mm -hmm. my experience working with five, over five years with Marion Chase. Mm -hmm. She worked spontaneously and with each individual, drawing them into movement with her. So it sounds like you answered my next question a little bit, um, but if there's anything you wanted to expand upon regarding what about her teaching or her mentoring stands out the most to you? She was very uh, proud and yet humble. Mm. So she would take the time. Many, many people wanted to um, study with her. And, and over the course of the five years that I was with her, she began teaching at uh, Turtle Bay mm -hmm. in New York uh, workshops in the summer. And that's where most of the... Um, organizers of the uh, uh, initial American Dance Therapy Association worked with her or trained with her. And that was more formal training. And perhaps there was a circle when they were in training. But for me, because I was just an individual, uh, it was more through discussion or more through her uh, demonstrating mm -hmm. what she was up to. She was very clear in her movement. She was very grounded, as I said. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting because it was dance therapy was like her fourth profession. Dance training dance therapist was her fifth profession because uh, she started out really as a concert dancer, as I said, but she learned uh, psychotherapy. She at Chestnut Lodge, we had some very famous psychoanalysts, Frieda von Reichman, Harold Searles, Otto Wills, 
and she worked with them. And at St. Elizabeth's, it was the beginning of the um, group psychotherapy uh, movement. And there was absolutely required training for everybody at St. Elizabeth's at that time. And uh, she worked with Harry Stack Sullivan there and Wilfred Overholzer. And it's, uh, that's how she learned about psychotherapy and the meaning of that but she knew that dance was the fundamental thing mm -hmm. uh, for interaction and communication of deep 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 feelings that patients sometimes were unable to express you spoke about marion's clarity in movement and i was just wondering if you can speak a little bit more about that i can imagine what that means but for others if you could just share a little bit on that well as i said she was very dedicated to this work. She was very pulled up. She had a dancer's uh, posture. She was very grounded. I know when disturbances came because they came often with unmedicated patients in those days, she would just pull up to her strength and, mm -hmm. and meet patients human to human, body to body. Mm -hmm. um, it's curious because many people were hurt in those days in psychiatric hospitals. She was never struck mm -hmm. by a patient in all the years that she worked mm -hmm. with very disturbed patients, both at St. Elizabeth's and Chestnut Lodge. I think she picked up their movement. Uh, there's this, all this discussion about mirroring, which is not my favorite word mm -hmm. because I call it more reflection. Mm -hmm. She would pick up their movements and respond to them, echo them and begin a movement dialogue that connected patients in a, in a very visceral and visible way mm -hmm. as an observer or as a participant observer that I was in the early days. It was, it was amazing some of the things that she was able to do with, with patients. You said you spent five years studying with Marion um, or apprenticing. Do you have a, a fondest memory about that time that you could share? There are so many because mm -hmm. I, I, I literally was with her. I mean, she was a very um, driven for the profession. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, you, you can see uh, she was already past middle age and she was working six and a half days a week. She was very impractical in that when she came to my wedding, she told me she had no idea what kind of wedding present she should give me. So she asked her daughter, and so I got the joy of cooking uh, via her daughter. But she also was building a cabin in the mountains in Virginia, which is just adjacent to uh, DC. And so I would go out there on the a Sunday, it was the only day she had there. And, um, and we were clearing the land of rocks and we used to th throw these rocks to the extremities of the property uh, with some pleasure and delight it was really fun not having anything to do necessarily with dance therapy not necessarily but i i definitely understand the relation i i used to throw rocks with my patients um in when i worked at a residential treatment facility that was a an activity that we did together as well so it makes sense to me at least um well she later built a cabin there and it's curious because i have completely unconsciously um before i moved to santa fe i bought property in the mountains of West, West Virginia, thinking I would build in a little A-frame, which I never did. Mm. But uh, it was only later that it dawned on me, ah, this is very close to where Marion had her, her cabin. Oh, interesting. Mm. So I'm, I'm interested in, and I'm asking folks to kind of explore what you would say the essence of dance therapy is as you understand it from both studying with Marion and then your time practicing? Well, that's a very complex one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, the essence of dance is simple yet complex, for, you know, paradoxically. I think from Marion, it's based on dance. And I think the hazard is going away from that to be too cerebral or too um, analytic, it's fundamentally dance communication of, of 
profound feelings, mm. expression of feelings, and hopefully for some validation from the participants, the therapist or the other people in the group, reciprocity. Uh, one of the things that I, that I say to my students is, I see you, I hear you, I feel you, I receive you, I respond to you. And that's really what Marion Chase was all about. She validated patients, however she found them, mm -hmm. however they related to her. And there was a, a, a visible connection that she could make with virtually anybody, which is extraordinary. And in the beginning, people said, oh, because she's, uh, it, she's working on intuition. No, she was working with some basic dance principles, I think, and expression and um, the feeling level of, of how dance touches feelings that are too deep to, to uh, express in words. Mm -hmm. I remember when she would give a lecture or when, before she would go to Turtle Bay, she would always ask the patients, what should I tell them? What should I teach them? And they would give her ideas, but one woman very uh, poetically said, tell them for a moment we live. Mm -hmm. And it was that aliveness for, from very disturbed psychiatric patients that uh, I learned from her. Is there a particular patient experience that you can recall that was meaningful for you or that kind of resonates with you still? Well, I had a patient, we should call her Mary, who was in her late teens and she was uh, selectively mute and she covered her eyes and walked around. She had to be guided around the hospital. Hmm. And the hospital had many small buildings and she lived in one of them and had to be taken to our building where we had dance therapy studio. And, um, I worked with her early in my training uh, for many weeks, you know, with her hands covered, no words, uh, her hands covering her eyes, I mean, mm -hmm. no words. And I would often, in those days, we <laughs> touched our patients more. So I took her shoulders and we would rock and sway and do some rhythmic activity together. And after about six weeks of working in this way with her, probably three times a week, she literally dropped her hands mm -hmm. and let me see her eyes. And she was very close to me, as you can imagine. So her eyes made really good contact with my eyes. And it was, it was a transcendent moment of mm -hmm. human to human connection and acceptance. Uh, apparently, she had shot out her brother's eye with a bow, mm -hmm. an arrow. And her parents and uh, others blamed her for making him blind in one eye. So she determined she would then be blind. Mm -hmm. And that was the origination of her uh, mental illness mm -hmm. to walk around covering her eyes, uh, being unsighted. And um, through dance therapy, she began to drop that uh, delusion. So we're, we're coming towards the end and I, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit, Judith, about the knowledge that you hold as a practitioner and an educator of dance therapy, what you would like to see carried on to the future dance therapists or the future of the field in general. Well, <laughs> you know, we didn't invent dance therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, it has existed for millennia in cultures all over the world. Mm -hmm. And these ritual expressions of uh, significant events in, in lives of individuals and building community. Um, so that's something to keep in mind that this is a, a heritage that, mm -hmm. that exists in humanity. This notion of moving together, moving for expression, so the thing that I would say is um, you have to know the body and you have to 
keep dance as the fundamental practice. Uh, I think there was this notion that verbal processing would follow dance therapy and that would be the better uh, solution or the better conclusion to a session. So I hope that undergraduates really study the body. Mm -hmm. And as I did, anatomy, phys physiology, kinesiology. But in addition to these core courses, uh, I think most of the learning, I think, comes in internships. Mm -hmm. So the internships are crucial. And that's the, the Chinese saying what I hear, I forget, what I see, I remember, what I do, I understand. Mm -hmm. It's through the internships and the students learning to lead their own groups is where the uh, training really, really, really solidifies and, and becomes so embedded. Then of course, uh, after thinking about the body, the brain is one of the most important parts of the body. So I think the future in neuroscience, which is beginning to have scientific research on elements of dance therapy that and the body and body movement that we dance therapists knew 50 years ago. We didn't have scientific knowledge for it, we just knew it. And so I think that's an important thing in the future, but I think uh, it has to be studied with, with experts or people who really understand the brain and how it manifests in connection with the body. It, it, it's not intuition, it, it's, it's working as I said, as a, in a humanistic person to person way. I think to be a dance therapist, there's lifelong learning because these sciences are and arts are evolving, developing, certainly has changed radically in the 64 years that I have been practicing. On the one hand, I think dance therapy is simple, yet paradoxically, it's very complex. Is there anything that I haven't asked, Judith, that you would like to share? Or any other thoughts that came back um, after you've had time to resonate with some of these questions as you've been answering them? Anything that you'd like to share? Well, I did mention that, that Marion was exposed to some of the seminal thinkers, both in, in psychotherapy, and, but especially group psychotherapy. Uh, as she was developing her practice in the beginning, I think we learn from our patients mm -hmm. because I think all of us have had our own experiences in dance and movement and how profound that is mm -hmm. and how we are drawn uh, to this work. I mean, it, it, it is a higher calling mm -hmm. and um, I, 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 I can't imagine having done anything else. And I, you know, I worked in a psychoanalytic hospital. I later worked at St. Elizabeth's, strangely enough, as the training officer working, supervising uh, the internships of dance therapy students from all the different graduate programs at that time. So we had a, a variety of students. I worked with forensic, maximum security forensic patients there. I've worked in day treatment. I've worked in private practice. It's evolving, keeping track of, of what, what is important. Mm -hmm. Of all those experiences that you mentioned in all those populations, did you have one that kind of sits in your heart a little bit more deeply than the others? I worked um, first in, at Chestnut Lodge with, um, psychoanalytic patients. And I watched these famous psychiatrists who often had, had their psychoanalytic sessions, like you talked about throwing rocks. Well, they were walking the grounds. We had beautiful grounds at Chestnut Lodge at that time. And um, in silence, they would walk. And they taught me so much, the psychiatrists, the psychoanalysts and, and the patients with whom they walked the reverence, the respect, I think that was, that was something. The forensic patients that I worked with were 
eager to move and they were what we would call underserved. Mm -hmm. They had very little treatment. They had, they were lifers. They were mm -hmm. committed and um, they were so enthusiastic to be able to move together and to be respectful mm -hmm. because they had been disrespected and they had disrespected others, mm -hmm. uh, which got them into, into prison in the start, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. But also my private clients, I worked in private practice uh, for many years and I focused on artists and writers who had um, psychological blocks to their work. Mm. And one client, I remember we worked for months on a wall. She was smack up against a wall and couldn't write. She would ball up the manuscripts, even though she had previously published several books. And through dance therapy, we finally attacked the wall and it came down very quickly. This was months and months of work, but it turned out the wall was styrofoam and it was light and it was penetrable. Mm. So one psychological image of a wall that stops you um, can be transmogrified into styrofoam. Mm. I love that. I'm also thinking about you, the way you spoke about the forensics patients and how they were so eager to move and engage and join. And I find that when people are often discarded by society for one reason or another, there is such a craving for community and, in, and healthy intimacy. And I feel like that's something that dance therapy fulfills. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They were a joy to work with because, mm -hmm. you, you know, a lot is written about the resistance of patients. These, these folks were eager and, and we established, well, they established a lot of the group norms, mm -hmm. which had to do respectful uh, interactions. We called each other by last names. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, I had an advantage and then I was older, uh, taking young, gorgeous interns <laughs> onto that unit changed the dynamic quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I was more grandmotherly perhaps to them, um, but they, they responded so well, calling mm -hmm. each other Mr. And uh, for the first time being respected and being respectful. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was big learning for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Mm. Anything else, Judith, that you would be kind enough to share or have on your mind? Well, I think this is a noble calling, mm -hmm. this profession of dance therapy. And I think if we go back to dance and if we go back to the, the basic premise, I mean, all the arts therapies are based on the art form. Mm -hmm. And when we think about it, um, there's an aesthetic to this work that also draws us in. It's, it's very rewarding when we are able to set that climate, that, that platform for people to have a, an extended beautiful experience mm -hmm. and be received and be validated. Absolutely. Mm, thank you so much. I've been inviting uh, my interviewees to do a little bit of movement with me. If you would feel comfortable with that, we could stay seated, we could whatever you want, but just a little gentle movement together if you feel like that's something you would. We'll have to stay seated because I'm in a very- uh, No problem. Strain spot here. That's okay. Yeah. I will join you if you'd like to start us off whenever you feel ready and moved to move. Oh, well, again, we think of our, of our core, of our breath, of our space, where our essence inhabits, and we reach out and invite you to join and be with us.
and perhaps gather in and give out. I can't see you though. I'm right here with you. Are you? <laughs> I am. And it's perhaps as Marion would do, just be fully inhabiting our bodies, ourselves, to make that connection, to make that reaching out. And whether not able to touch, we've been doing a lot of Zoom teaching, but Touching is a little more constrained in this day and age than when I first started out, but we can still demonstrate reaching out and bringing in another. Thank you. So just um, thank, thank you so much for this time. It was, it was an honor to speak with you and listen to your stories and um, just be present with you and see you and receive you and hear you. So thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. I think this is a noble project and uh, I appreciate uh, your reaching out. And of course. it's very hard to take down 64 years. <laughs> I, I um, imagine. And I, I had some notes, but I, didn't cover everything, but it's all right. Oh, we it's can we can go back and do part two if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs>